So today's lecture is on connectivity. Uh, we talked a little bit about, we introduced the idea and sort of motivated a little bit the definition and why it looks the way it does here on Monday. So today I want to finish uh, proving by proving that the interval 0, 1 is connected. Uh, I'm going to state some theorems. Probably we won't have time to prove most of these, but I will at least state these. Uh, and then I will talk about a thing called path connectivity and then do some proofs related to that that bring connectivity, that show generally what these proofs look like that involve connectivity. OK, so we started off with this question about generalizing the intermediate value theorem. And uh, we realized that we needed some assumptions. And then uh, we mentioned this uh, lemma that we have these three properties that are equivalent for a subset of x, uh, that the boundary is empty, the set is closed and open, and then correspondingly, the complement is closed and open. And uh, we mostly went actually skimmed through the proof last time, but let's, uh, let me just highlight some of the facts there because this is kind of an important thing for this lecture. So uh, if we want to go, if we know that the set has empty boundary, well, an empty boundary is always a subset of A because any set of empty set is a subset of anything. And closed means exactly that the boundary isn't there. So therefore the set is closed. Also, the openness condition is sort of vacuously verified because the boundary being empty, the intersection with the set A is open, is empty. Uh, so in terms of the definitions that involve the boundary, this is easy to show. Of course, it's a little bit trickier to show if you use the R definition. It's possible to go through the cases, but uh, with this, it kind of falls directly. Now, B implying C, so if you know that the set is open and closed, then, well, if A is open, then its complement is closed. If A is closed, then the complement is open. And well, so you get the same properties for the complement. So uh, these pro this property of being both open and closed uh, it is preserved by taking complements because individually they get flipped, these conditions. So if we want to show finish the proof of equivalence, then we have to go from C to A. If we know that the complement is open and that the complement is closed, we want to say that the boundary is empty. Well, it sort of goes via B, but if A complement is closed, open, then A is closed, so the boundary is a subset of A. And well, if the complement on the other hand is closed, then A is open, then the boundary intersected with A is empty. So you have these two properties, boundary is in A and boundary contains no points of A. So the only way to reconcile these two facts is that the boundary is empty. So boundary, because it's a subset, it's equal to the intersection with A, which by the second part is empty. Okay, so this shows that A implies B, B implies C, C implies A. So these are all equivalent. So this is good to keep in mind by what we say later in the lecture. So connectivity is related to the existence of open and closed sets. Uh, and we stated the definition fairly quickly. So I want to recall it a little bit again. So the main definition for connectivity is X is connected. If whenever you express it as a union of two open sets, then one of these sets is empty or conversely, the other one is a full set. So of course it's possible, and a crucial thing here that I should highlight is that these sets are disjoint. Of course you can cover uh, by two open sets always, that's fairly easy, uh, but the issue is covering in such a way that these open sets don't include anything in common. Uh, now a trivial case of such a covering of this one is empty, so that's why the statement has to include that as a possibility. And uh, how does this relate to what we said about open and closed sets? Well, if your space is disconnected, then there are open and closed sets that are interesting. But on the other hand, sort of counterpositive of this is this lemma statement. 
that if your space is connected, then this is equivalent to saying that the only open and closed subsets are the empty set and the full set. So if we want to prove this, uh, let's just do one direction here. Uh, so if we know that it's connected, so we know that X is connected, and suppose and fix a subset of X, which is closed and open. Okay, then if you want to cover the space, one natural thing to do is to take X and express it as a union of A and A complement. Now, because A is open and closed, then A complement is, well, in the opposite order, but still the same conclusion, closed and open. So both of these sets in particular, both of them are open. So if we define A equals U, A complement is equal to V, then both of these sets are open. So now either by connectivity, one of these has to be empty, A is equal to empty, so which is U, or A complement is equal to, which is V is equal to empty. So, but A complement being empty means that A is actually the whole space, which is the other possibility in connectivity. So the only closed and open subsets of a connected space are ones that are uh, the whole space or nothing. In a disconnected space, you have different open sets. So a good example is a union of two intervals that don't touch. So this is not connected. And the reason for that is that you have these two open subsets, U and V, that cover the space. Both of them are open because they are an intersection of an open subset, open set with X. Uh, or you can verify this from the definition of open, whichever you want to use. And then uh, they are disjoint because they're in, they contain only points in the intervals. So this returns back to our example yesterday in the beginning and reassures us that we're going the right way. Now, a small remark, if you have a subset of X, uh, then there are some slight issues, you usually want to use open subsets in X. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you can also use open subsets in A, but it's easier usually to do the proofs when the set sets are open in X. So there's an equivalent definition of connected for subsets that if you have two open sets that cover A and that they're disjoint, then either A is a subset of one, A is fully contained in one of them. So either U or V. Conversely, one of them has empty intersection with you. So A intersected with V in this case would be empty because they're disjoint. And then the other case, A intersected with U would be empty. Okay, so with this preliminary, let's prove that the interval is connected with this set. So what we actually prove uh, prove is that if a subset of zero one is open and closed, then a is either equal to empty or a is equal to the full set. And by lemma, this is enough. Above, this is sufficient. So, and that's why this makes it a little bit easier to sometimes prove things as to use this open and closed logic. Um, this is often how you also use connectivity, but okay. So you start off, I mentioned last time already that soup plays a role here. Uh, so we start off from a subset A and we assume that it's closed and open. Now there's two cases really. Either zero is an A, 
in which case we will define this as of being inter interest uh, to be A. If zero happens to not be an A, uh, because uh, I want a non-empty set to work with for sure, then I will consider the complement of the set A. So I define B as A complement. Now B is an open and closed subset with the property that zero is in B. So this is kind of set up for this proof uh, to ensure that zero is actually an element of the set. Now, then we go through a contradiction argument, uh, or you could do it directly, but the contradiction works. Now, suppose that A, uh, B is not equal to, yeah, suppose first that A, our set that we start with, is not equal to empty set or the full set. Then B is not equal to empty set or the full set either, because if B was one of them, then A would be the other. Uh, okay. So let's define the complement of B. Now there are two cases, either it's the A's complement or A, so we, but I don't care which one. I just want to give it notation. And I define the infimum of this set. And the idea behind this infimum, as I'll draw a picture soon, is that somehow this should be at the boundary and this is the source of the contradiction. You have to work a little bit because there's also the boundary zero one. That's not a boundary in the space X. So we have to be careful about that. And that's why we need to do this preliminary stuff. But so define infimum to be A. Now there are two possibilities. The question is I, either, or does A belong to C or A belong to B? It has to belong to one of them. But we'll see that both of these lead to a contradiction. Well, if A belongs to C, then because B is open and closed, then C is also open and closed. So in particular, C is open. And this means that A minus epsilon, so there, because it's open, it means that there exists a delta positive so that the ball, which is now A minus delta, A plus delta, intersected with zero one, is a subset of Z of C. Now a small thing is that A cannot be equal to zero because zero is in B and B is open. This part is small step. So A is not equal to zero because I have to worry about this endpoint. So what, it, what this means is that there are smaller points here that actually also belong into C. So if I take uh, A minus delta over two, uh, this must lie in the interval zero one. Actually it has to lie in the interior of it because uh, this interval cannot intersect zero. Uh, so we get a point that lies in the set C in the interval zero one and A minus delta over two lies in C. But this is a contradiction. Since A was equal to infimum of C, but which is strictly bigger than a minus delta over two, which is in C. So contradiction. Infimum cannot be strictly bigger. Now, going the other way, you might expect that, okay, B switches the roles. So instead of talking about C being open, we focus on B being open. So let's assume that this boundary, this kind of transition point infimum of the complement, it lies in B. But then, but B is open, so there exists a delta positive, so that X minus delta, uh, A minus delta, this time we have to be a little bit more current, intersected with zero one. And I'm doing this intersection because that's the space of points that I'm interested in. So this set, 
uh, is contained in B. But this means that if I take minimum of A plus delta over 2 and 1, this point has to also uh, actually let's not do this argument because it's a little bit annoying it's a more direct argument so but a is equal to infimum of c so there exists an x in c so that x is in a minus delta uh, a between a and a plus delta so by the fact of being the least upper bound least lower a greatest lower bound so there exists some point in c that this is the case but then x would belong also to this interval so x would also belong to a minus delta, a plus delta intersect with 0, 1, because c is a subset of 0, 1. So c intersected with a minus delta, a plus delta intersected with 0, 1. This is not empty. But this means that c intersected with b is also not empty. But this is a contradiction because C is equal to B complement. These together form a contradiction. This was by construction and or by definition, and this is by construction because C contained a point very close to A, but all those close by points should be in B, but that can't be simultaneously true. Uh, questions? Uh, so while people think potential questions, I want to say that this innocent looking proof that the interval is connected is something you should really study. It's something actually quite important. If you understand this proof, you understand a lot about connectivity. So, uh, yeah, I would not think that you understand it by hearing it once. You get some of the steps and structure. You should read it again uh, and make sure that you, if you want to fully understand the concepts of this class, you should actually memorize a version of this proof in your head because uh, it's a thing that comes up over and over again in various things. And sometimes, sometimes you need the statement that zero one is connected, but many times actually you need this argument instead. So sometimes it's easier to use the proof than to use the statement. So this type of proof is actually very, very deep and very important in real analysis. So um, it's worth worth trying to understand what's going on here. Uh, and uh, for that, I just want to draw a quick picture of what we kind of did. Uh, we have our set A. The A contains zero, well, the B set contains zero, and then A does something. A, A could be kind of weird. It can have components, so that's one of the things that, or pieces that are not, it's not necessarily an interval. Uh, so we have to be take care of that. But what we are assuming that it's not the whole thing. So there are some points in C. And these are points in A. I mean, there are many points in C, of course, but everything in the complement. So I want to get something at the boundary, but because A is not an interval, I have to somehow be careful about where I get the boundary. But I look at the first boundary point, and this is captured by the idea of an inf. That is our inf of C. Inf of C. And uh, then we observe that this picture cannot happen. Well, if this point is in B, then you can go in, enlarge B a little bit. 
and that means that there are no points in A. But if it is in C, on the other hand, then C could be enlarged. So you would go a little bit lower than that, and that's contradicting it being a lower bound. So the orange is greatest lower bound, the other one is lower bound. So this is common with ints. Uh, so if in C. So this picture is impossible because that boundary point, it cannot be in either of them. But it ha it's a real number by completeness. It has to be in somewhere. So some somewhere there is a contradiction. And the contradiction is the existence of such a scenario. It's antithetical to connectivity. Uh, so we some example so that's zero one is the most the simplest example of something that's connected now you want examples you don't just want examples of things that are connected you want the opposite as well things that are not connected so this we discussed above you can define u as zero one v as two three so this is an example of thing that is not connected but there are other ones that are more subtly not connected. So Q is not connected. And the reason for that is that if I take A is say equal to minus square root two to square root two, of course, that's not a rational number, but notice I take the open interval and I intersect that with Q. So this is now a subset of A, a subset of Q. It's certainly open as an intersection of an open set, but also a is equal to the intersection of my, the closed interval minus square root two, square root two is Q. So it's also closed, but it's certainly not empty. But A is not equal to zero, empty set. And A is not equal to Q. So it's not, the space is not connected. Um, it's worthwhile to think that why, how this is different from real numbers here, because square root two is not a rational number. That's why this construction is possible. It's not possible when you include everything. So somehow here we have this dense set of holes and those holes are disconnecting the space. And that's what this box, the boundary is hiding in those holes. And that's how these connect to each other. Now, another example is the discrete metric space. You've uh, shown and seen that all subsets uh, of the discrete metric space are open. Uh, so uh, say A is equal to, uh, if I define U as equal to the singleton, some singleton and V to be equal to X take away U. Now these are two non-empty sets that cover and non-empty but x is equal to u union u union b let's put that so u union b so these are some standard examples of not connected spaces so rational numbers uh and uh Uh, that there's Wi-Fi issues, so I have to re have to reconnect my screen. So that's uh, a non-empty set. Now, I just want to mention some strat general things. Uh, there are two types of proofs that you might want to do. You might want to show that something is connected, something is not connected, and a good to keep to keep in mind is that one of these is considerably easier usually easy is to show that something is uh, not connected. I mean, it's not completely trivial, but it's usually easier at least. And the reason is why, because you just have to find an example of a set. So like with the discrete space, those examples in the previous slide, the proofs are fairly short because all you have to do is you can, you disconnect the space. You find something that's open and closed, such as an A, or, you find two disjoint non-empty open sets that cover the space. So showing that something is disconnected is actually just a job of finding the good sets. 
to prove that something is connected is the harder thing because then you have to show that it's not possible to do that. In other words, you have to talk about all the coverings of the space. And the proofs often need to choose a scheme. Either you start from A being open and closed, and then you conclude that A is empty. So if A is empty, then it's fine. And if it is not empty, you have to show that it's actually the full space. So this leaves only two possibilities for open and closed sets, empty or full. This is often a nice way to structure the proof. Another way of structuring the proof is you start from this U and B, and you prove that one of these has to be the empty set, or one of them has to be, usually the logic goes easier if you think that one of them has to contain everything. So it's good to keep in mind that there are two different ways of looking, this open and closed, or this sort of open covering idea. And when you prove connectivity, it means that you have to talk about all the coverings and do this kind of deduction. And proving disconnectivity is just witnessing or give an example of a single covering or single set A. Now, using this logic, you can prove that other things are connected. For example, for the real nine is connected. And the idea is basically the same. You start off from an open and closed set. You want to show that it's either empty or full. And you use the idea of inf and soup, but you have to do some cases. So there's, because zero doesn't have a special, special role, you just say that, okay, if, well, it's you assume that neither is case, so you can find an X in A and a Y that's not an A. And the idea is then that Y that is not in A, that you'll find the point somewhere in between these. But then there are two cases to consider that last time didn't appear. One is that X is less than Y, which was the case we dealt with before. And then you define it as an infimum of something. So the first point that does not belong into the set. If you have the opposite, then you have to flip things and that introduces another level of technicality. So you have to consider X bigger than Y and consider the soup instead but otherwise it's exactly the same proof as for zero one. So that's why I don't write it out here in, in detail. The scheme is the same. The idea that you use inf and soup is the same, but the new thing is that you have to do case checking, X in, uh, whether X is less than Y or Y is bigger than X. Any questions? So now we have two examples of connected spaces, R and interval zero one. Or, or any interval a, b. Okay, so let's state some theorems about connected sets. Uh, and uh, I, I won't prove these now because I want to stay focus on other things. Uh, and uh, one general thing about, I mean, for any concept, how to structure and remember these theorems is that uh, usually when you introduce a new concept in mathematics, in real analysis is the first thing you have to do is you have to see how it behaves under certain operations. And the basic operations in metric spaces or this class are taking images under continuous functions, taking pre-images, taking subsets, and taking products of spaces x times y. Notice how in the discussion, in the homework, and in the previous uh, weeks, what we've done a lot of the time is state theorems that if X is complete compact, Y is compact, then X times Y is compact. So it's really studying these notions on what happens to them under these basic operations, which ones are preserved, and then examples for when they are not preserved. And this is usually very a sort of a basic understanding of how these concepts behave. So in this case, for connectivity, the two things that behave quite well are products, and uh, not free images actually, uh, exactly not free images, but namely images work well. And so thinking of this, all the other ones fail and these, these are the ones that succeed. So for images, if you have a continuous function, a subset that is connected, then the image is connected. 
And you might want to think about our discussions on what happens to open. So openness is not preserved under imp taking functions. On the exam, you saw that projecting even doesn't preserve closedness. So you have to be careful with these properties, but connectivity, it works fine. And a picture of why it works fine is sort of you argue by contradiction. Uh, so on the X side, you have some set A that you postulate as being connected. Uh, and then you have your function f that takes it on the y side of things. And suppose that it's not connected. It doesn't hurt to draw this kind of picture where we have the two pieces. Pieces, misspelled. Uh, okay, so what does this give you? This, these two pieces rigorously, in this case, it's nice to think that they give you an u and they give you a v. that cover the space and are not empty. Well, what happens now is that you can take those u and v and pull them back. We want a covering on the x side in order to derive a contradiction. And how we do that is we just take the, co the cover, the pre-images of these sets, f inverse of v and f inverse of u. Because u and v cover the image, the pre-images will cover the domain. And pre-images of open sets are open. So we're in a good setting. Now we have a covering of A by two open sets. And it turns, because of it's connected and these sets have to be disjoint, it has to belong to one of them completely. And that's where you get your contradiction because the other one was assumed to be non empty. So kind of you pull the coverings back under the function. And that's where you get the property. Now, Let's, if we look at our nice example of a, something that's disconnected, then the other way you can't go. If you are trying to pull back, you, have, you start off with a subset on the Y side and you pull it back on the X side, things don't work out nicely uh, because if you take a disconnected space, you can squeeze these onto a connected space by shifting them, say. Uh, in this case, f is meant to be continuous, yes. So you can verify that f here is continuous. It's a good exercise to think about why that is the case. But one reason is that you have x that is continuous, x minus 3. Both of these are linear functions, so they're continuous. And OK, you might worry about when they two, the two met graphs meet, but there is no point where they meet because at 0, 1, and 3, 4, they're disjoint. So in this case, they're not continuous. For the theorem, you have to have continuity because you have to pull, pull back. Of course, if you don't have a continuous function, all hell breaks loose. There is no hope for any statements like this to hold. A not continuous function, you could imagine as doing almost anything to sex that you could imagine. So you don't usually hope for statements to hold for all functions when talking about metric spaces. Only reasonable thing is to talk about continuous functions. So in this case, you have a continuous function that takes a non-connected space and then shifts it onto itself, making it connected. So images can be connected. Uh, images are forced to be connected, but pre-images are not. And uh, so that was images and a counterexample for pre-images. Now the next thing is uh, products. And things for products work out nicely again. So you have a theorem. If x is connected, if y is connected, then the product space is also connected. And I don't want to spend time now doing a detailed proof. Some of these you can very well read. But I want, especially to guide the reading, I want to give a picture of this. So how you can imagine this is you have your x factor. That's some sort of an interval. You have your y factor. These don't have to be intervals. They can be more general. So they're kind of, they're abstractly sitting in for these connected spaces. And then the product of these is some sort of a rectangle. I'm in an abstract rectangle. And 
how the scheme of the proof is, is again by contradiction. Let's suppose we were in a setting where we had u and v that would cover the space, that would be open. And suppose they don't intersect. They're not supposed to intersect, so I draw them like this. I mean, somehow they, we have a sense that they have to get close, and this is where the contradiction ensues, but let's draw them in a way that they, it's not immediately obvious that the contradiction happens. Now, you, what you can do, you discussed this in the discussion yesterday, that, uh, and also this was discussed in the last time. So if this U is open, now you can project it down to an open set of X. You can project the other set also to an open set of X. These have to cover the space. And what this gives you, so first we create a cover of X using projections. And then we find a line like that, which intersects both of the sets. But this is not a good setting. You have a line here that intersects both of the sets, or a connected copy of Y that intersects both, but it has to intersect the boundary because that factor is the same as the factor Y. So you only look at this part, you compare it to Y, and you observe that you get a covering of Y by open sets, which then cannot be disjoint. So there are some subtleties here in the step, but the scheme of the proof is you want to project into these factors in a subtle way. So not a proof, an idea of a proof. But what you can do with this statement once you've proven it, you can show that products of spaces are connected. So R times R is connected because we showed that R is connected or indicated how to prove it. If you take now R cross R is connected. So also if you multiply again by R, R3 is connected. And if you repeat this n times by induction, you get that Rn isn't connected. So all the familiar Euclidean spaces are and are connected by using the statements about product spaces being connected, if the factors are connected. Okay, so now we have examples of connected sets, more examples. We have intervals, A, B, we have R, we have R, N, and if we take other factors, we can take factors of intervals, A, I, B, I, so say, I mean, boxes, like a1, b1 times a2, b2, dot, 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 times a n, b n. So boxes are also con connected. All of this can be shown by what we've stated about. Uh, and these also match intuitively. We perceive as boxes as being connected sets. So we're still on good territory in that we haven't encountered a set that should not be connected by it, but as an artifact of our definition would be connected. So we're in a good place. Uh, so now the second part of this lecture uh, talks about another notion of connectivity. Talk, returning to Monday, this is the more intuitive one, albeit we have to introduce some terminology here. That makes it a little bit, uh, that requires some new, some care. So one is we need to talk, so the idea is connecting by paths, but we have to say, what is a path? So a path is a continuous function from an interval to a metric space. So just some curve in the space, that's the way you visually represent them, but you, we insist on continuity. So it's a curve because it looks like you take the interval and somehow spread it out around the space. So it's a curvy or bendy curve and allows for quite a generality because the target can be any metric space. But if you want, you can think in Rn, you can take think of a parametrized curve. This is exactly that same idea that you've seen in 32A, uh, say a helix, for example, or something else. Those are all curves. 
Um, now, sort of trivially, we say that the curve connects two points if it starts at A, X, so at A, the initial point of the parameterization, it's X, and at the other end point, it is Y. So it starts at X, goes at Y. Of course, the curve can do wild things. It can zigzag, it can go, it can return back to X, but as long as it goes to Y, that's a valid curve. So this is an, that's an example of a curve that you might have to consider, but usually you draw them a little bit nicer. But you should be aware that there's no, no law of mathematics or any uh, natural law that prevents these curves from doing anything that they ever want, as long as they remain continuous. OK, so with this notation, we can define uh, that a space or a subset thereof is connected if, for any pair of points, there is a curve, or we can call it path as well, that connects x to y. And we should emphasize that lies in x, especially since we often talk about subsets. We, there might be curves in a bigger space, but we insist that this, these curves lie in the space of interest, which may be a subset of something else. So if a subset of x, then we would say the same thing, that that lies in A. So it would be the same. Of course, if the full space is X, then all curves have to lie in there because that's the only thing that we know of. So some examples of path connected uh, is that uh, the interval 0, 1 is also path connected. And why is that? If you take two points and you want to connect them, then X lies somewhere there, X, Y lies somewhere there. So there's a, what you can do is you can linearly interpolate between these points. So a standard way of doing that, you define gamma as gamma of T as T times X plus one minus T times Y and T is in zero one. And this function is continuous as a function of T. It's a linear function. And therefore, that defines a continuous path. <laughs> it turns out that this is actually almost the only way of uh, proving that something, this kind of linearly interpolating, is the main way that you would ever prove that a space is connected, name or a path connected. So, for example, the ball, you can do exactly the same thing. You can define gamma of t. So gamma is a function from zero, one into the ball, and it's defined by, you take the linear combination of T and X, but you do this linear combination in such a way that gamma of zero, if you plug in zero, then the first factor vanishes. That's why it's convenient to write this this way. And if you plug in one, you get that the other factor vanishes. And again, gamma is linear, so it's easy to see that it's continuous. And this would require a proof a little bit, but let's not focus on that now because we're focusing on the time. So straight paths give the easiest way of connecting things. And uh, well, related to that, we define that and generalize this idea that leads to convex sets. So if C is a subset of Rn, we say that C is convex uh, if for every pair of points in C, for every T in zero one, T times X plus one minus T times Y is also in C. And this thing here, this is called a convex combination. So if X and Y are in Rn and T is in zero one, then the element sometimes denoted with a subscript CT is called a convex combination if it's expressed as this linear combination of these two. And these always should be visualized as spanning a line, line segment between these points. OK, 
Okay, our time is almost up. So I want to state some theorems and let's see what we will finish. We'll finish in a video for Friday. So convex sets are path connected. The line segment connects them. Uh, and there are examples of convex sets, say balls. Uh, but how does this relate to connectivity? This is the crucial thing to understand. And there's really only one picture you have to understand well for this setting. Namely, the so-called topology sine curve. What it looks like, it's the graph of sine 1 over x, so something that oscillates, but oscillates very widely close to 0. And then you want to make it closed, so you add to it 0 times minus 1, 1 the limit points of that. Or you could take the closure of the graph if you want. Now, this is a space that is connected, but it's not path connected. So this is the canonical example. Uh, and you can see a lot of good discussion in Q about this example. Uh, that is something that's connected and path, not path connected. So they are slightly different notions so, and in terms of say our exam, if I asked you, how are they different? This example really exemplifies how they are different. Uh, and this, uh, I will discuss that more in a separate video when I actually do these proofs. But, so what is the relationship between these? If you are path connected, then you are connected. So path connected is a stronger condition. And its proof is very nice, but I, we don't have time for it now. Because convex sets are path connected, an immediate corollary of this is that convex sets are connected. And actually, this is, I don't know, 50% of the time, if you want to prove that something is connected, you'll actually prove that it's convex. So it's a par fairly powerful tool. Uh, if the set is not convex, then it's really hard to prove that it's connected and usually requires some pretty advanced machinery or knowing quite a bit of things. So the other way is not true. Connected sets may fail to be path connected. The topologist sign curve is the main example of that. But if you add an assumption, then you do get a converse. So if you have an open subset that's also connected, then it is path connected. So usually, if you cover up this part, connected does not imply path connected. But together, so an additional assumption sort of saves you and you still get a true statement. So it has to crucially use the openness and without it, it fails. So a lot of theorems were stated here. Some of them you may discuss next time in discussion. And I will add another, there will be a video for Fridays uh, that will cover some of the most important ones of these. But you should, of course, also read on your own uh, these uh, theorems, especially the one about zero one being connected because that's so important for anything. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to stick around and I'll be happy to discuss more.